السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن والاه اللهم افتح مسامع قلوبنا لذكرك يا الله please open the hearing channels of our hearts to your ذكر اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنا يا الله Help us be of those who listen to the word of admonition and follow the best of them. Continue our analysis, inshallah ta'ala, of the texts, the main texts that are relevant to the issue of the fiqh of bid'ah and sunnah, as we mentioned. And let us see what we can also learn as far as uh, the fiqh is concerned, inshallah ta'ala. The text of the Qur'an, I think this part we have already uh, talked about briefly, but enough for us to already, from the text of the Qur'an, to see that there is a concept of good bid'ah. In accordance also to the many commentators on this ayah as they understood it. So that's already a very strong beginning on this issue of the concept of bid'ah and that there is such a thing as good bid'ah. Simply because the word bid'ah in language has nothing in it inherent to mean evil. It's something new, innovated without prior model or example, for example. That's all it is. So don't be, don't be harsh on yourselves to use the word bid'ah. Get used to it. But then we will learn about what is the wrong type of bid'ah and the good type of bid'ah. And why sometimes the word bid'ah is mentioned uh, and it is mentioned to mean wrong, but it is sometimes mentioned to mean neither wrong nor right. Even in the fiqh sense, by in the language of the fuqaha. Not every time you hear the word bid'ah by a faqih, the fuqaha, especially of old, then you think they mean this is evil. They're simply saying this is new. They're not passing a judgment about it. Unless it is said in the context in which you're going to understand that they mean by that the negative part or, or, or side of or, me, or meaning of bid'ah. Now, analysis continued. From 1 and 2 and 3, I told you now don't ask me. From 1 and 2 and 3, what do we learn? 1 and 2, remember 1 and 2, what they taught us? That's 1 and 2. Everything. What does 3 teach us? Mantuk. The mantuk, and I'm sorry, the mantuk of one and two, the explicit meaning of one and two is that every new thing is a bid'ah, is, is an innovation, and every bid'ah, every innovation is dalala. Text number three. Now, text number three says what? The person who introduces something new, or in other words, who innovates something new, however, now this is qualified. And now this is a qualifier. That which is not of it. Uh -huh. In other words, this text is saying by reverse logic, which is called al mafhum it is explicitly saying that which is introduced in our deen, which is not of it, is balala. But by reverse logic or by implicit logic, it is saying that if we introduce something that is of the deen, then it is good. So that's why from 1 and 2 and 3, by the mantuq, by explicit logic, 
And that's, for example, what the scholars said, and I'm quoting one of them, the great Imam of the Hanbali Madhab, all the Madhab say the same thing, in this case of the ulama. Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah ta'ala, says, كل عمل ليس عليه أمر الشارع فهو مردود بالمنطوق that is explicitly every action that is not in accordance to the matter of شرع it is rejected and by reverse logic by implicit logic he said كل عمل عليه أمر الشارع فهو غير مردود and therefore every action that is consistent with the matters of the lawgiver, of the shari' Allah Azza wa or His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then it is not rejected. So what is he saying? The first one is bid'ah, balala, the second one is bid'ah, hasana. Al-Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his great Al-Fatih al-Bari, on the commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari. For example, he says, on these things, مَنْ اِخْتَرَعَ فِي الدِّينِ مَا لَا يَشْهَدُ لَهُ أَصْلٌ مِنْ أُصُولِهِ فَلَا يُلْتَفَتُ لَهُ Whosoever introduces and invents in matters of the deen, that which the shara, in principle, or the principles of shara do not witness to its veracity, then we should not pay attention to it. In other words, anything introduced that is not somehow in conformity with the principles of the shara, the principles of the shara, it is rejected. In other words, that which is introduced in the deen in conformity with the principles of the shara, it is accepted. And that's why he said, this hadith number three, مَعْدُودٌ مِنْ أُصُولِ الْإِسْلَامِ This hadith number three is considered of the axioms of Islam. Number three. Now up to this point, some of you are still not clear enough. What is usul al-shara? What is qa'id al-shara? That which, if it is brought anew, and it does not have that which supports it in the shari principles. What is he saying? What are shari principles? What are shari methods? What, are, what is he saying? He is not saying in the Quran or in the Sunnah. What we have covered. That if something is introduced not in conformity with either go ahead, count with me Quran, Sunnah or Jima'ah or Qiyas or Istihsan or Masalih al-Mussala or Sadd al-Dharai' or Istishab or Al-Urf or or that's what it is not because it's not in the Qur'an, it's not in the Sunnah, it is therefore rejected. No, usul al-shara, the usul of the shara, you know, the sources of the shara are not, as we have established first, are not only the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The Qur'an and the Sunnah and all the rest. So if the scholar doesn't find for this new supported thing anything to support it in these sources through the proper methodology. Remember that box? Through the proper methodology of analysis, finds nothing, and all the ulama don't find anything, then that's bidatun balala. But if they find legitimization for it, explanation for it in some ways in those sources through that proper methodology and then that is good bid'ah that's what they are saying next again hadith number four hadith with Sayyidina Bilal 
Rasulullah sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem said to him, you know, part of that statement, وَمَنْ يَبْتَدَعَ بِدْعَةً ضَلَالَةً لَا يَرْضَاهَ اللّٰهُ وَرَسُولُهُ Whosoever established a bid'ah, brought in a bid'ah, in other words, invented something new in Islam, in the deen, that is dalala, that does not please Allah and His Rasul. That's the manquq again, that is by explicit logic, it's wrong. And by reverse logic, by implicit logic, that means by the mafhum, if one introduces, if the mushtahid, if the scholar, if we introduce a bid'ah that is huda, not dalala, not dalala, yardaha Allah wa rasuluh, pleasing to Allah and his rasul, then it is accepted. That's why mafhum al-mukhalafa, as they call it, the ulama. They call it the word mafhum, meaning mafhum al-mukhalafa. Reverse logic. Right? And that's text number four. Text number five. Sunnah Hasana. Text explicitly mentions Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Man sanna, <coughs> excuse me, and the proper methodology. And this, most don't know, except scholars. And many scholars don't know well, except deeply rooted scholars. Because that's the realm of the deeply rooted scholars. And therefore, from here, one and two, also one way to argue that by the ulama, rahimahullah ta'ala, text one and two give us a general import. Every bid'ah is dalala, general. Now, part of proper methodology in that box by the ulama is never to take one text and draw conclusions from it. And that's what many people young people and not so young people do in dealing with ilm. Reading it in one book and not verifying and not exhausting the references and the words of the ulama and the analyses, etc. Reads one text or two texts and draws a conclusion, sometimes even not the right conclusion, even from the text, and says this is what it means. That's wrong methodology. It's not scholarly methodology. That's a student who is learning and still making a lot of mistakes. But what they do, they collect all the texts together and they apply the proper methodology. Part of applying the proper methodology is to collect all the texts together. And then we see that text one and two give us a general import Text number three, four, and five, we say in the language of the fuqaha, is muhassis. Takhsis al That is, text number three, four, and five have done this. They have gone to the general texts, which seem to include everything, and have removed from everything some of them. That's called takhsis. You know, like sort of, of an exception. Removing some elements from the set to which the rule does not apply. So, and that's the khasis ul And many don't know this and don't know how to apply this. Simply one way is, you can't, you can't ignore the other text and take only kullu bid'atin dalala. It's, it's not proper. And how to reconcile between the two logically? Logically, that is called in the language of the logicians of law, that's called taqsis ul am. Texts number three, four, and five are texts that are saying that some of the bid'ah is excluded from that generality, from being described as dalala. 
And those texts are three, four, and five, when the text says there is bid'a, hasana, there is bid'a, sayyah. And the texts about man hadatha fi amrina hada ma laysa minhu, that which is not of it, the one who introduces in this deed of ours, that which is not of it, that which is not of it, this statement is muhassas. This statement will exclude some from that generality, from that general description of dhalala. That's the logic in fiqh. The text, what is the meaning in the text 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12? I have given you, I have given you a, a, an idea about that, I think which is, which is, uh, which is good enough. But I'm going to say a little bit more on the text number, uh, uh, number uh, 7. Yeah, actually, yeah, it is, it's already at 7, yeah. Text number 7, the story is like this. And this is an authentic text also. Before Rasulullah taught something about when someone uh, joins the Imam while in Jannah Salah in congregation and joins late. In the early stages Rasulullah did not teach anything yet. And you know what they used to do in course, what the texts teach us? They used to, if somebody comes late and he joins and he, 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 he asks those who are praying, he indicates to them, you know, through signs or so, how many rakat have I missed? And maybe they say this or this, one or two. So what he does, he goes, does what he has missed, one or two, and then joins. This is what they used to practice. Sayyiduna Mu'adh, who is relating the text, he says, I do not do that if ever this happens to me. And that happened to him, and he did not do that. He joined immediately Rasulullah and after Rasulullah said, Salam, he stood up and made up what he missed, like we do now. And said, Salam. This is what, what is it called? Rasulullah did not do that. He did not teach that. And Sayyidina Mu'ad did that. This is called what? Bid'ah. Bid'ah. This is called Bid'ah, first of all. Now, what is the response of Rasulullah That's the most important thing. He said, upon seeing this, he praised Mu'adh radiallahu ta'ala. He did not tell him, how did you do that without seeking my permission and without asking me the question? Because I didn't do that. I didn't tell you to do that. This is what we're learning. He, on the contrary, said to them, Sanna lakum Mu'adh. Mu'adh, Send for you. Brought something new for you in matters of law and deen. Follow him. In other words, Rasulullah had always known that by Allah. But the time for it to be divulged and unraveled was that time. So this is Bid'ah. This text, Sanna lakum mu'av, in other words, this is good, is another text that also does what? Explains what Rasulullah means by Kullu bid'atin dalala wa kullu dalalatin finnar wa man sanna. Now, acts of the companions, approvals of Rasulullah, these other texts are explaining to us what Rasulullah meant by the other texts. Not to take them in isolation. Text number 8. Sayyiduna Umar says, Ni'matil bid'atu hadihi. Rasulullah as you know, 
used to perform Qiyamul Layl in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan. During his Ramadan, he used to perform Qiyamul Layl also in his, own, in his own quarters. And then came other people, other companions, and joined him little by little. And he didn't say anything. And the second night, he didn't say anything. And the third night, he didn't say anything. After that, he did not allow them. He did not open. He didn't come out. And he stopped that. And he says, don't do that, in other words. I don't want you to do this. And he mentioned the reason. He mentioned the reason. Lest they're going to think they have to do that. And he stopped. Until, for years and years, until the time of Sayyidina Umar, after some time, then Sayyidina Umar did something. First of all, he started Qiyamul Layl again, not privately, but in the masjid, in congregation, not only for three or four nights, but for the entire month, not only for the entire month, but for every year. And in this manner. All of which are new that Rasulullah did not do. He did not do it. He did not call for congregation. He did not call for it. He did not continuously do it. Only for a few days. And it continued for years. And that's not what Rasulullah did. In this sense, it is what? Bid'ah. It's something new. For surely new. This part, yes, he led for three, four nights. Yes, to follow him exactly would be to do what? Three or four nights and stop. Even if we assume we can do that. After he says, I don't do that. But to continue to do it, and in this way, and to call for it, and to collect, and to lead 20 rak'at, to allow uh, Sayyidina Ubay Bukat to lead with 20 rak'at without witr, this is all bid'ah. Again, take, get used to the word. I'm saying bid'ah that is in the neutral sense. Neutral sense. Now, when they began to practice that, and Al Khalifa al Rashid says, the one about whom Rasulullah said must have meant the hadith number 12, follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the Khulafa al Rashidun. This one, in other words, is interpreting for us what Rasulullah meant. Now he says, this is a good bid'ah. He says it, نِعْمَةِ الْبِدْعَةُ هَذِهِ This is an excellent bid'ah. That's what that text teaches us. <coughs> Excuse me. Text number 9 and 10. <coughs> Excuse me. About collecting the Qur'an. Again, it is teaching us about what Rasulullah meant by Bid'ah that is dalala. New thing that is dalala. All of these, that's what they are teaching us. All of these texts, mashallah, not just one. Now, when Sayyiduna Abu Bakr, now say, so when Sayyiduna Umar comes and suggests to Sayyiduna Abu Bakr, was the Khalifa, let us collect all the scrolls of the manuscripts of the Quran in one mushaf. What is the answer of Sayyiduna Abu Bakr? Let's learn simple in simple ways. He says, how can we do something Rasulullah did not do? What he's saying by this statement, this is bid'ah. Yes, this is bid'ah. Now, even I am not still used to saying the word bid'ah in a neutral sense. <laughs> this is bid'ah. In other words, this is new. He did not do that. Now Sayyidina Umar in his arguments with him and then says, Huwa wallahi khayr by Allah. This is good. This is virtuous. 
So what is he saying by this statement? What are we learning from this statement? It's bid'ah hasana. It's bid'ah yes. He's saying he's agreeing. This is bid'ah yes, but this is bid'ah hasana. This is a good bid'ah. And you must have told him the arguments at their levels. Rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiyallahu ta'ala alhum ajma'in. Then he keeps on, you know. He keeps on arguing, he keeps on. Now what, keeping on arguing, arguing meaning in, in the intellectual way, in a scholarly way, in a spiritual way, in a moral way, maybe even assertively, what is this teaching us? Let's see if you, if you get the right lesson from this. This part, what is this part teaching us? Hmm? They didn't likely just take it. They discuss it, they argue it. In other words, they analyze it, they keep talking about it because they seek Allah's pleasure. It's not like you tell me it's bid'ah khalas. Even you who say it's bid'ah, you should think about it. Bid'ah new, but again, think about it. So they are thinking about it, they are talking. And then Sayyiduna Abu Bakr says, and then my heart was guided to what? Umar radiallahu ta'ala had suggested. Which means what here for us? Yes, bid'ah hasana, we established that. So, but this process, the process, what is it teaching us? Convince you can change your mind. Ya ayyuha scholar. Wa ya ayyuha student. Wa ya ayyuha muqallid. Imitator or mushtahid. These are mushtahidun, let alone the muqallidun, who follow others. You can uphold something you thought it was a bid'ah even as a mushtahid. And nobody here is a mushtahid in that sense. And yet, by listening, by pondering, by praying, you can end up changing your mind. Something that was thought bid'ah can become, after processes of thinking and of analyzing, and of mashura, and of istikhara, we can change our minds and we can find out actually through more logical methods that actually it is not a bid'ah. Doesn't this teach that? Very clearly. And even strongly so when the same case goes to Sayyidina Zayd bin Thabit, same thing happens to him when he's ordered to start the process by the Khalifa, that's an executive order, now execute. He's still, his companion, his great companion, says the same thing, what Rasulullah didn't do that. So then now they say, Abu Bakr and Umar, yes we know, but this is good. They must have argued, and they continued until Zayd bin Thabit changes his mind. That it is not bad bid'ah at all. That it is good bid'ah. Good thing. And that's very important to learn here something of the process as well. And the meaning in 12, as I mentioned, is to teach us to also follow. Alaykum bi sunnati. That we should do our best and the scholars do our best to lead us and to instruct us to always remain on course and uphold the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam properly understood through the proper channels of knowledge not in a, in a, in a, in a random unscholarly uh, um, extreme non-systematic approach we are, we're seeing that, that's very important. Not because I, I have bachelors in science, or even a PhD in science. And some of us think because we're like that, so we have the right to argue in usul al fiqh. Hey, take it easy. Believe me, I know. Believe me, I know. And I know the bright mathematicians, when it comes to usul al fiqh and fiqh, they operate as though they have no IQ. Believe me, I know. That's a different discipline. 
And it requires also the proper condition of the qalb, of the heart, as well. Now, and therefore, and therefore the textual analysis text tells us that from 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, these teach us about the acts of our self, of our predecessors. Right? In these examples we have seen acts of our earliest self, of the greatest of all generations, in understanding and in implementing this text of Kullu Bidatim Dalal 1 and 2. And therefore there are there are the, uh, the, the texts that explain and elucidate and comment on what those texts mean in practice. And that's what they mean. This is the Salafs, our predecessors, in this case the greatest of all, the companions. I gave those names and there are many other instances, believe me, which we shall mention some later. They are telling us about how to understand kulla, the text, kulla bid'atim dalala. Is this clear? Do you, feel, do you feel clear about it? No questions at this point. Not yet. Not yet. Is it clear up to this point? Now, similarly, I want to just introduce one more thing because some will, so those are serious students of ilm, might encounter that. Text seven, six, seven, and nine. In six and seven and nine, actually, we are learning about different usages of the word sunnah and sanna, the verb sanna. And for example, in text number six, it is teaching us that the person who resurrects a sunnah, the person who resurrects a sunnah that already exists, has set up also a model for others to follow. Because they were not practicing it, let's say. It is already a sunnah by Rasulullah but people stopped practicing that. Someone comes, a scholar comes and revives that, that's also con is contained in the meaning of setting up a sunnah. In the sense of what? Reviving an already existing sunnah. Man ahya sunnatan. Man ahya sunnatan. That's also included there. Or, but also the teachings of number seven, the teachings of number seven, for example, and nine and others, teach us that Sanna means, is meant in the very also literal sense of introducing something that has no prior model or example in the teachings, for example, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. قَدْ سَنَّ لَكُمْ مُعَافِ خُبَيْبْ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَرَضِ اللَّهُ تَعَلَى عَنْ أَوَّلُ مَنْ سَنَّ رَكْعَتَيْنِ قَبْلَ الْقَتْلِ all of these are about things that did not exist before in matters of deen, of ibadah even. I want to underline that very clearly because this is ilm, it's soldier, we have the right for it. This is in matters even of ibadah, salah is ibadah, jam al Quran, collecting of the Quran is ibadah. And that all the other texts, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, are about insha, i.e., starting something that was not there before. Not only reviving something that was there before, but starting something that was not there before. How do we know that? As you have seen from the texts 4, 5 through 11, and there are other texts. These are the ones I chose, because all other texts on the matters of uh, Bidda and so on, revolve around these.
Now, let's start something else, which is very important. First of all, as a principle, and listen to this, as a principle, and Nabi, as the ulama say, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lam yaf'al jami' al-mubahat. Wa Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lam yaf'al jami' al-mandubat. Now the statement is, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did not do all that which is permissible. Logical or not? That which is permissible in accordance with the rules of the shara is, you know, figuratively speaking, is infinite. Specifics of halal, of permissible, of lawful. He did not do every lawful thing. He was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, doing other things and teaching us and communicating to us. And he could not, because he's a human. He cannot do every permissible thing that he taught us in principle is permissible, but specifically he did not teach us this, nor did he do that. Obviously. It's that simple. When the ulama say, al nabi lam yaf'al jami' al-mubahat. And therefore, if there is a nabi did not perform this mubah, therefore, I cannot do it. It's not part of our deen, nor is it logical. Though some may even do that, nor did he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, do all the mandubat, all the recommended practices and things. Something recommended. He did not do every specific recommended thing, obviously, because the recommended things are semi-infinite. He ordered us through the Quran and through his teachings that everything good, you do. Everything mustahab, you do. And this does not mean that he did every mustahab thing. He taught us that every mustahab thing is good. He taught us the principles of istihbab, of what is good. He taught us the principles of permissibility, of ibaha. But he did not, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor anybody can in his or her own lifetime do every mandub and every mubah. It's normal. This is very important logical shara'i principle, natural principle even. Isn't it? Now keep that in mind. And therefore, as the ulama, the scholars say, rahimahullah ta'ala, because al nusus al amma shamila lil mandubat bi jami'a anwa'iha. Because there are texts in the Quran and or in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that comprise with the general uh, way they are worded, they comprise all the possible mandubat and all the possible mubahat. For example, when Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَفْعَلُوا الْخَيْرَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And do good, all good, that you may attain felicity. Khair, this is general. And the word khair, فَعَلُوا khair is general. It includes, figuratively speaking, infinite specific cases. Anything that is khair. وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يَعْلَمُهُ اللَّهِ And whatever, whatever, مَا لِلْعُمُومِ بِمَعْنَ الَّذِي Whatever good you do, Allah is aware of, knows it, His Zawjil. These texts and many other texts as well as in the Sunnah of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم tell us that anything mandub we do, but it doesn't tell us all the specific mandubat, nor are we able to do every specific mandub, every specific beautiful thing, and every specific permissible thing. It's impossible. Now, this leads us to the question, this is an introduction to the question of at-tarq. 
and the ulama mentioned this, some many are, are, are unaware of this, a tark. Taraka, the verb taraka means what? Hmm? To leave something, not to do it, for example. To turn away from it, not to do it, to leave it. Now the question of tark now is in fiqh. The fact that, for example, Rasulullah or our great predecessors, our Salaf al-Salih, righteous predecessors, taraku something, did not do something. Tark. Does this signify, does this imply that we cannot do that which they did not do? Logically speaking, think about it. This is very serious question and most have not thought of it and you have been taught and we have been taught by some rahimahullah ta'ala that if it is not done you don't do many because we were young and so on and still some have not asked the question as to why in the logical shari sense now we shall see that the answer to that question they did not do therefore we do not do is untenable and unsustainable untenable and cannot be sustained and unsustainable from the logical linguistic sense and the logical shari sense Well, first of all, when somebody does not do something, let's say, first of all, Rasulullah did not do something, as long as he did not prohibit it, there is no statement that says, don't do that by him. And he did not do that. What are the probable, possible reasons that he could not have done that for? For example, the ulama mentioned, simply he did not do that by habit. Ada. Ada. That's his Ada not to do that. A famous example they give, he was in a majlis sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with some of his companions and, and they offered them food and they brought a desert lizard called the bab, prepared well, a mishwi, and they, and they offered it to him, his guests, his, his, whole, his hosts. And the companions were with him, with whom was, of whom was Sayyidina Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu ta'ala And they said, this is Rabbi ya Rasulullah. And then he pulled away. And then Sayyidina Khalid, when he saw him pulling away, he asked the question, is it forbidden ya Rasulullah? In other words, he did not eat it. He did not eat it. And Sayyidina Khalid asks, is it forbidden ya Rasulullah? He says, no. It is not my habit. My people were not used to this. We don't eat it. Out of habit. Then Sayyidina Khalid went and said, I'll take care of it. The ulama, most of them say, what did this teach? Here's something in the presence of, of all of these, Rasulullah did not do and explicitly says, it's not haram nor makruh. Go ahead and eat. I just don't like it. This, to the jurists, is very important precedent for the basis of what tark implies. Abstinence, not doing. What does it imply? He could have done it for another reason. All these are reasons. Out of concern, that if he does it, they would think it is going to be obligatory. Do we have examples of that? Like Tarawih. And many other examples, many other examples in his lifetime. He could not have done that for another reason. Well, he simply didn't care to mention it. Some say he didn't think about it. I don't know about that. No, it's possible. Because they give an instance of that when a righteous companion woman came to him and suggested 
that she built for him, because she was rich, rich and she had trees and so on, she built for him a, what? A minbar. First minbar was built by a woman for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Built for him a minbar. He never asked for a minbar. He did not do that. And this woman comes and suggests a minbar. He said, go ahead if you like. So, that's a reason why he did not have a member. He did not ask for a member. He did not require a member. And then after that it became a practice, a sunnah. Because he didn't, in a sense, think about it. They say, Rahimahullah ta'ala. Or again, because that which he did not do is already included in the general texts of general import in the Qur'an or in the Sunnah, like إِفْعَلُوا khair, Do khair, uh, Avoid sharr. These are general texts. وَفْعَلُوا الْخَيْرَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ For example, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ These are general texts which include Many details. Maybe he did not do that because it's already included as a specific in the general texts. And he did not do that because he does not do every mandub nor every mubah. And many other reasons. Even he did not do that because there was another way to do it which was better. Better doesn't mean the other one is bad. Good and better and best. Afdal, as the ulama say, afdal. He did something that is afdal. And he even recommended things that is afdal or not. He recommended things that is afdal or he permitted things that is mafdul. Less than the better, but good. While the good, the better was there. Just to teach us that that can happen. Imagine this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam telling Abu Bakr, Sayyiduna Abu Bakr, wa Umar, Sayyiduna radiallahu ta'ala wa sahaba, when you meet Uwais al-Qarani, and he never met him, and he was a tabi'i, khayru tabi'ina Uwais, and that's his prophecy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you're going to meet him, when you meet him, ask him to pray for you. Who is better, Abu Bakr and Umar, or Uwais? Whose dua is better, Abu Bakr and Umar or Uwais radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in? Abu Bakr and Umar. But here is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, ask him to pray for you. In other words, in the presence of the, of the father, the mafdul can take place. Not because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't do something or the salaf didn't do something and there is something else. If they did it, if they didn't do it then it could not be because they do always the best. That's not true. That's not a true statement. Some scholars have made that statement. But that's not a true statement. Here are examples. Rasulullah and the companions did do things that are less, if I may use the wrong English, less good in the presence of that which is more good, better. That's not because if it were better, they do it. It's a statement you've heard it's many, in many places. It's not true. It's an example. As a matter of fact, Rasulullah tells a woman, tells a man who comes and pleads for prayer to recover his sight. And he says to him, shall I, shall I give you better? Be patient. It's better for you. The man says, no, pray for me. What does this teach? That Rasulullah allowed something less good to be done when he himself recommended something that is best at the moment for the person. Yes? And you will enter Jannah. And he says, no, pray for me, Ya Rasulullah. And Rasulullah taught him something. To pray and to ask Allah for relief. So the statement that if it were good, they would have done it, it's not logically correct necessarily.
Because they could do something that is good but less good than that which is better. And here are examples. And therefore, if these are all possibilities as to why he did not do Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or they did not do our Salaf, these are all possible reasons because they did not, you don't find in a text, if you find in a text, I did, did not do this because of this, that's a different issue. But if they didn't do and there was no because of, all of these are possible, valid, probable reasons. Now, the logical axiom or principle, if there are all of these reasons that are possible, what does it say about the conclusion, the logical conclusion? Can we make the point that this is the reason? No. That's why they have a rule I wrote underneath. إِذَا ثَبَتَ الْإِحْتِمَالِ سَقَطَ الْإِسْتِدْلَالِ They have a rule of law in Usul al-Fiqh. إِذَا ثَبَتَ الْإِحْتِمَالِ سَقَطَ الْإِسْتِدْلَالِ In other words, if we introduce an element of probability or doubt on an issue, and there are many alternatives, then the claim of this alternative to be the only one falls down. That's why, for example, in courts of law, even in secular law, in defense procedures, in defense tactics, well, what do they use usually sometimes? It is close to this principle. They try to introduce doubt in the evidence or possible reasons for that. Since all these are possible, you cannot ascertain this to be true. Because there are all these possible reasons. And those possible reasons introduce a doubt. So we cannot say, the scholars are saying, you cannot say that if Rasulullah did not do something, or the Salaf did not do something, therefore it is haram or makruh. That is untenable. More reasons why that is untenable, now textual. Allah said in the Quran, the ulama teach us, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ And I'm underlying those that are important. What our Rasul وسلم, brings to you or orders you, take it. What he forbids from you, keep away from it. Avoid it. The ulama say, Allah is telling His Rasul and therefore telling us, He's telling us, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولِ He's defining for us what we can do and what we cannot do in our relationship with Rasulullah Wasallam. He says, if He tells you to do something, if He brings something forth to you, do it. If He forbids you, stay away from it. The ulama say, and Allah is the ultimate lawgiver and the creator of language and of logic. He did not say, did not say, وَمَا تَرَكَهُ فَانْتَهُ عَنَّ He did not say, and that which he did not do, keep away from it. Where did this rule come from? That says, he doesn't do, we don't do. We don't do meaning, we must not do. Allah did not say that. Allah said and defines our relationship with the Rasul and He defines it in this way. And the Turk was not mentioned or included. He did not say what He does not do, you must not do. Again, Rasul, and there are other texts. I, I pick another hadith of Rasulullah related by both Bukhari and Muslim. Rasulullah now says, like explaining the Quran, وَمَا أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ فَأَتُوا مِنْهُ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ وَمَا نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ Whatever I, whatever I order you, do of it what you can. 
Whatever I forbid you, keep away from it. He defines our relationship with him. The ulama say, he did not say, وَمَا تَرَكْتُهُ فَاجْتَنِبُوهُ He did not say, and what I did not do, what I abstained from, you must not do. He did not say that. So that is not included in the usul of the fiqh of what is sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu And therefore, the next level of argument, therefore in usul al-fiqh, the grammar of law, the principles of proper uh, fiqhi thinking and analyzing, because those of us who read books and read Quran and read Hadith and come and argue, this means this, this means that, that's popular discourse. And we have to stop that. Many people who are educated in sciences or in color, we think, as I said, because we're that, we can do that. Knowing, reading, knowing how to read, having a PhD, reading the Quran, reading the Sunnah, doesn't make the person a jurist. Be very careful. Now the jurists from the Quran and the Sunnah, they have therefore developed the statement that for example, the Sunnah of Rasulullah comprises the definition, the usuli definition of Sunnah comprises al wa fi'l wa taqreer The words of Rasulullah what he said in commanding and prohibiting etc. His fi'l, his doing, he acted, he did, he did, he did, he did. And his taqreer and his approvals of things explicitly as he saw them or tacitly as he saw them or implicitly. This is the definition in usul al-fiqh of sunnah. They did not say, the ulama of the usul al-fiqh, they did not say nor mention tarq and they did not say and part of sunnah is what Rasulullah did not do is sunnah. The ulama of usul did not mention that. Part of the usuli argument, they say, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in, in their logical way, التركة أصل لأنه عدم والعدم الأصلي لا يدل على حكم you know, not doing, as is my translation, ترك not doing or absence of acting is the original state you know, my original state is I don't have that's an original state and then when I have that's a new thing my original state, for example, is Adam, non-existence. Then I'm created, then I exist. The original state of not doing something is original. That's, that's the original state. It does not have a judgment value. It does not have a judgment value. It is not conveying, when a person is not doing anything, that is not conveying a value judgment of good or bad or this or that. It's just a normal state. It's the original state of things. It's not a legislation. It's not a verdict. Except, they say, and that's truly logical, the permissibility not to act. In other words, when Rasulullah is not acting, what it is conveying, as long as there is no other evidence that says otherwise, such as prohibition or, 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 or otherwise, when he's not doing something, the only logical value judgment out of this is that I also may not do that. It is permissible for me also not to do that. It is not saying or conveying that I must not do that. Or it is 
not recommended to do that. It is simply implying logically that it is permissible for me not to do that as well as the subject of the law, as in Mukallaf. And that's truly powerful and logical. And that's why we have scholars, rahimahullah ta'ala, some of the statements of the ulama, and we close with this for our, inshallah ta'ala, for our break for, for lunch, inshallah uh, ta'ala. And, and then we resume, and then we, uh, we, we recapitulate at 2 o'clock for Salat al dhuhr One of the, so these are some of the greatest ulama uh, in different madhahib. I picked few of them mentioned by the ulama. Al-Imam ibn Lub, rahimahullah ta'ala. Abu Sa'id ibn Lub, one of the great ulama and fuqaha and so on of Al-Andalus, of Andalusia, a long time ago. For example, he says, on, in the response to one issue, to one question, and one concern that some have leveled, that raising hands in dua after salah by the imam in congregation, dua together, is it right? Is it wrong? And there are those who argued that it was not done in the time of Rasulullah and in the time of the Sahaba in this fashion, in this modality. Raising hands together, Imam saying dua loud, and all of them raising their hands and saying ameen. In this fashion, it was not done before. Is this bid'ah or not? And he says, Rahimahullah ta'ala, and part of the argument is that it was not done as the main argument. He says, Rahimahullah ta'ala, فَالتَّرْكُ لَيْسَ بِمُوجِبٍ لِحُكْمٍ فِي ذَلِكَ الْمَطْرُوكِ إِلَّا جَوَازَ التَّرْكِ وَانْتِفَاءَ الْحَرَجِ فِيهِ He says, this great jurist, he says the Turk, abstinence from something, not doing something, as we established already, I'm just now lending to what we said, support by more statements of the ulama, that not to do something, to abstain from something that is by Rasulullah or by the Salaf, or in general, ليس بموجب الحكم في ذلك المطروك does not necessitate that there is a, a حكم, a verdict pertaining to that which was not done except the verdict of permissibility not to do and وانتفاء الحرج فيه and that there is no blame in doing it and there is no blame in doing it and or in not doing it. Rather, I'm sorry. وَأَمَّا التَّحْرِيمُ أَوْ رُسُوقُ كَرَاهِيَةٍ بِالْمَطْرُوكِ فَلَا But to argue that not doing, not doing necessitates something to be haram or even reprehensible, then no. وَلَا سِيَمَا فيما له أصل جملي متقرر من الشرع. especially if this matter that is done, which was not done, has to support it a general principle from الشرع. like the question of dua. he says رحمه الله تعالى. the point here is not the example, but that is at this level the point is the principle. Shari, logical principle that the ulama and some have used. Even Ibn Hazm, you know, Ibn Hazm of Zahiri, the literalist of Al Andalus, also says the same thing. And when, for example, those who say it is makruh in his time to perform two rak'at after the adhan of Maghrib, after the Adhan of Maghrib, before the Fard of Maghrib, to perform two rak'at, they say it is makruh on the basis that Sayyiduna Ibrahim al Nakhai, one of the Tabi'een, said that Sayyiduna Abu Bakr, Sayyiduna Umar, and Sayyiduna Uthman did not use to pray those two rak'at. He replies, and I'm translating now, you can read it in Arabic, if even that report is authentic, it is not a proof against performing those two 
because in that report it does not say that Sayyiduna Abu Bakr and Uthman and, or Ali or Sayyiduna Abu Bakr or Omar or, or Sayyiduna Uthman ta'ala anhum, it did not say that they said don't do that. And then he says an example Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa never fasted a full month besides the month of Ramadan. He never did that. And yet, that is never a conclusion to be made that nobody can perform nafil or siyam of an entire month outside of the month of Ramadan. Nobody says that. Nobody can say that. In other words, again, a tarq not doing without another evidence against it, such as prohibition or from the rules and the principles of the shara, by itself does not imply prohibition nor even a reprehensibility and therefore not even wrong kind of bid'ah. Again, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah ta'ala, even Imam Ibn Taymiyyah in his work in Majmu' al-Fatawi, he says in a, in a, long, in a longer part, I'm going to translate, it's, it's a very beautiful statement as a principle, at least as a principle. Many of them, he's speaking of scholars and muftis, have unfortunately missed on certain benefits in the deen that must be considered in our shara. On the basis that those specifically were not mentioned in the shara. And thereby having missed on many obligations and many mustahabbat and many recommendations as a consequence. Because it was not done, it was not said explicitly, therefore don't. The consequence, you know, you're not applying the other rules of the shara, the consequence, they missed even to do many obligations, many obligatory things that are not obligatory by text of the Qur'an nor of the sunnah. And they have missed on doing and practicing many mustahabbat things, recommended things, in both matters of dunya and in matters of deen, in matters of this world and in matters of religion as well. Or even, as a consequence, have therefore fallen into committing forbidden things and reprehensible things. Because those forbidden things or reprehensible things have not been explicitly mentioned in the other source of the shara. And he even said, and in even, they could have been mentioned, but the mufti or the alim or the student simply was not aware of that. Even Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. And therefore he says, we say, as an Imam Shafi'i himself points out, an Imam Shafi'i himself points out and says, كل ما له مستند من الشرع فليس بدعة وإن لم يفعله السلف. This report, related by Imam Zarruq in his work and many other scholars, that Imam Shafi'i said, and the quote is, كل ما له مستند من الشرع. Every matter that has support from the شرع is not bid'ah. Even if the Salaf, our predecessors, did not do that. Support from the Shara. What is the Shara here? Hmm? Ah, the whole Usuli sources, the whole sources of Islamic knowledge with the proper Usuli methodologies. This is a powerful statement. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah says, as he's speaking about al-Maslah al-Mursala, another source of Islamic law that some disregard and don't mention and don't use because they don't know or they knew and forgot or that is careless in research or there are emotions or some reasons. He says, Rahimahullah ta'ala, it's very powerful. I shared with you the statements months ago in one specific class. And I even ask you to guess who the 
who the author was, and to, to guess that it is Ibn Taymiyyah for those who read it will read well, would be very unlikely. But that it is his statement, rahimahullah ta'ala, again in the Majmu'ah, he says that Maslah al-Mursala is when the Mujtahid opines and sees that the action, this action, will draw a benefit that is very probable. And there is nothing in the Shara that prohibits it or that speaks against it. Until he says, and similar to this concept as a source of law, in the practice of the Sufis, he says, and he's saying this in a positive sense. وَقَرِيبٌ مِنْهُ ذَوْقُ الصُّوفِيَةِ وَوُجْدُهُمْ وَإِلْهَامَاتُهُمْ And close to this principle of Maslah Mursala is the concept of spiritual taste of the Sufis and their wujd and their experiential feelings and experiences and their ilhamat and their spiritual inspirations. The gist of it, he says, is that they find in words or in certain deeds a benefit in their hearts and in their deen and they spiritually taste the fruit of it in, in an acceptable shari sense and they taste the spiritual fruit of it and he says Ibn Taymiyyah says rahimahullah ta'ala and this is maslaha this is benefit And he says, and drawing benefit is in both matters of dunya and in matters of deen. In other words, applying this rule of masalih is not only in matters of deen, dunya and mu'amalat, but also in matters of deen, in faith, matters of religion, matters of ibadat. And he gives examples in matters of dunya, like trades and interactions, uh, which are defined as drawing benefits to people without there being any prohibition from the shara, the text of the shara. And in matters of deen, he mentions like many of the special knowledge and the special spiritual conditions and the special worships, ibadats and asceticisms and zuhd of that are also described as having benefits for the human being without there being any shari prohibition, that is, the practices that are spiritual as well. What is he saying? The gist of it is what? That that which is not explicitly mentioned or done in the shara, as explicitly, specifically, by itself, does not mean you should disregard it. Especially if there is established benefit from it through the proper means of scholarly analysis. And this is a very, very powerful statement by a scholar like that, rahimahullah ta'ala, with all of his, some of his views, rahimahullah ta'ala, that are quite controversial but very interesting nevertheless. Rahimahullah ta'ala jami'an. So we're going to stop here inshallah ta'ala at this level because at this level I need you as you go inshallah ta'ala for, for lunch to think about it and to summarize that in your minds. What have you learned up to this point before even you go home and you keep reviewing that and, and analyzing that? And then we'll continue after that, inshallah ta'ala. We'll continue after that when we come back where we left off. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala.